All right, well, let's talk about the results of the National Beef Quality Audit uh, that we had in 2011. Uh, and as you look at it, there are three phases of the National Beef Quality Audit. The first phase is face-to-face -face interviews. Second phase are in-plant uh, tours and data collection. And the third is actually doing more surveys with cattle producers saying these are the results. How can we make changes to improve the quality and consistency of our products? Let's talk about the face-to-face -face interviews first. As we take a look at that, we went to the food service industry, we went to the retail grocery stores, we went to packers, we went to government officials, and we went to feed yards and asked them, when we talk about quality, what are the issues that you face? And what are your definitions of different categories, like eating satisfaction, like food safety, uh, where cattle are raised, and what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the beef cattle industry? So as we look at, first of all, we did ask them to define food safety and ask them where does that rank, and you'll notice that in all these groups, with the exception of the feed yards, food safety is by far the number one category that's most important to them when we talk about beef. And uh, they said, really, there's no question. There, food safety is the minimum that you have to have if you're going to produce a beef quality product. If you take a look at eating satisfaction, it was interesting to see differences in flavor and tenderness between the different sectors. And actually, based off of these results uh, in 2011, flavor became much more important in the minds of the food service and retail. And so because of that, we're doing much more research in that area. Uh, before that, it was just tenderness straight across. And now it's flavor, and so you'll see a lot more flavor research being done here at Texas A&M University. When we take a look at how and where cattle are raised, um, it's interesting how different sectors have different definitions. If we take a look at the retailer, they have origin of product, and that's because of country of origin labeling. Uh, that's something that they have to put on the package, what country that beef came from, where it was produced, where it was harvested. And so that's very important to them. Well, if you ask food service, animal well-being is more important because they don't have country of origin labeling, first of all. Secondly, is there's been a few incidents where uh, products, particularly hamburgers, you know, uh, there have been question marks as to the, the wellness, the way those animals are handled. In reality, it's just a few minor, very minor incidents, a couple of bad actors, but what they did is uh, they created doubts in the minds of consumers with respect to all beef, and so that's a concern to those, that industry. So, so it's interesting to see how different sectors define different issues. If we take a look at genetics, this was one of the biggest surprises for us, and we asked people, when we say beef cattle genetics, what does that mean to you? And it's interesting how four of these groups, we had both the retailer, food service, packer, and feed yard say black-hided cattle. And while we at the university don't define genetics in that term, that is something that the industry and the way that they look at genetics. So that's something, again, that uh, shows a trend in the beef cattle industry. Uh, if, we, if we look at the strengths of the industry, it's interesting that uh, food safety is recognized as one of the strengths of the industry. Also product quality uh, is a strength and that there are premium products. There are different kinds of levels, different levels of products that they can offer customers. If we take a look at weaknesses, uh, you know, you look through here several times and it says, first of all, the two main weaknesses are we have too fragmented of an industry where there's information that does not flow from cow-calf to consumer and back, where we really don't know how good a job. We can't get a report card as to the job we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. The second one is not telling the story and how we're letting other groups define animal agriculture instead of us showing people what we're doing and being proud of the way that cattle producers uh, are, are producing cattle. For the most part, they're doing a great job, but uh, that story is not being told. If we take a look at the quality challenges over time, you'll see that they, there is some changes. You'll see that food safety has become you know, the number one criteria. Uh, eating satisfaction is second. You look at that as you look at the early audits and that's generally not the case. So those, there are changes in shuff, uh, shuffle in the minds of the different uh, sectors as to what is most important in our industry. Now let's go to phase two and let's look at some of the findings, the major findings in some of the packing plant uh, data collection that we did. And the, probably the most interesting thing about that part of the audit is we found out that the industry has truly changed and has become more uh, kind of defined in how they produce beef cattle 
for specific types of consumers. When we first went back in 1991, every day's production looked exactly the same. They would bring cattle in from all different walks of life, all different parts of the country, different production systems. They bring them together, harvest those animals. All every day looked pretty much the same. But when we asked them, you know, we want to come in and audit your plant in 2011, they said, well, what day? Because on this day, we're doing the branded beef program. On this day, we're doing U.S. cattle. On this day, we're doing cattle that were actually born in Mexico or born in Canada, raised in the U.S., but they were born there because of the cool. They keep those separate. And so every day's production was somewhat different. And there was a tremendous increase in the number of branded beef programs or what some people might call niche-based beef programs, which you'll learn more about in that particular lecture. So when we went into the plants, you know, we had to choose a day when this is the U.S. cattle, kind of the general population. So that's when we went into those plants. And when we did that, we looked at cattle and uh, quality issues both on the harvest floor, in the grading cooler, and even into the fabrication uh, room uh, with those cattle. Uh, these are the plants that we went through. Uh, and we did, first of all, we looked at and said, okay, what kind of identification? If we were able to trace them back, is there even identification in their ears that would help us do that? And we saw that, yes, about 85% of the cattle had at least a lot tag. That lot tag is given to those cattle when they come to the feed yard in the first place. And we saw that only about 50% of the cattle had an individual animal ID. And something interesting, though, that has been a change since the 2005 audit, and as you look at these bar graphs, you'll see that the red is 2011 and the blue is 2005. And as you look at that, you'll see there's been a tremendous increase in the number of electronic ear tags. These are ones that can be read long distance with a radio frequency identification kit, and you're able to be able to tell that animal's ID through a, uh, digitally through a computer. And that's something that has changed dramatically. We had just 5% back in 2005, and now we're over 20% in 2011. Now, we mentioned the black-eyed cattle earlier, uh, and you can see from this chart when we actually looked at hide color in the plants. And this is cattle that had 51% of a predominant color. And you'll notice that by far the majority of the cattle were black hided At least 51% of their hide was black, and 61% of those cattle had that kind of hide. And you'll see next to that is red. Okay, Holsteins are on the increase, so there's quite a few Holsteins out there as well. And then yellow is in that mix and gray, which are generally crossbreds with Angus types of cattle. If we look at uh, the predominantly black eyed cattle, that's dramatically increased if we go back to the 2000 audit. So another area that we have been working on in our industry is bruising of cattle. Production systems have been put in place redesigns of how cattle are handled at the feed yard as well as the packing plants. And so as you can see from this chart, we have uh, tremendously increased the percent of cattle that do not have a bruise. Where if you go back to the 2000 audits, you'll see that 53% of the cattle did not have a bruise. And now in 2011, we found that 77% of the cattle did not have a bruise. There's still work to be done, but there has been improvement in that area. Then we went into the cooler to look at the grade data on those cattle. The first thing we discovered is the increase in the number of branded beef programs that are identified in the grading cooler. Where back in 1995, there was 1.3. And generally that was certified Angus beef and then maybe another program like Sterling Silver, which is a Cargill program for cattle that aren't black-hided, that are similar, uh, the similar program to CAB, but are cattle that might have a red hide or a yellow hide. Uh, and then you'll notice in 2011, it was 6.4 branded beef programs that are being identified in the cooler. That means we are taking the large group of cattle and segmenting them into more specific marketing endpoints to specific types of consumers. And you'll be learning more about that in a future lecture. Most people don't realize that uh, we do not only harvest uh, feed yard steers, but heifers are also an important part of that mix. And generally it's a one-third, two-third uh, where two-thirds of the cattle in a feed yard are going to be um, steers and one-third are going to be heifers. What we're seeing here are the, is the data going back to the 1991 and looking at it all the way through the 2011. So over that 20-year period, how have the carcasses that are being produced by the beef industry changed? And you can see in generality that there is more uh, cattle have generally a higher quality grade, that they are heavier, 
just a touch leaner, a little less fat. That's what yield grade is. It's an estimate of leanness, and so uh, the lower number is a better number. So 3.2 in two th 1991 versus uh, 2.9 in, in 2011. You'll see the USDA quality grade has gone up slightly. That number behind that number has gone from, if you look, 86 to 93, which doesn't sound big, but that does dramatically improve and increase the number of cattle that are choice, on that because that's just the average. If we look at fat thickness, you know, fat thickness has gone down slightly. Carcass weight is continually going up. In uh, 1990 and 2011, the average carcass weight was 825. Today, it's somewhere in the 850 pound range. So you can see over time there has been cattle change as far as higher percent choice and particularly heavier cattle coming to harvest. Uh, here we're looking at the changes in prime and choice cattle. This is the percent of carcasses that were prime or choice going back to 1974 when a similar audit was done and you can see that over time from 74 that the percent prime and choice dramatically went down, but it has started to uh, 1995 and then has uh, started to increase to the point of right now, today, it's probably closer to 70% of the cattle that are coming out of feed yards are grading choice. And so there has been an increase over time because of production systems, because of the way we raise cattle and the weight that we're getting these cattle to now uh, when they get to harvest. The other issue is yield grade fours and fives. Yield grade four is, and fives are very, very fat cattle and are, are a real inefficiency to our industry. The goal is, is to have a yield grade number two. Remember, there's five yield grades. One's the best and five is the worst. Yield grade two and three are kind of where we're shooting for as an industry. And fours and fives are very, very fat. So because of that, we don't want these fours and fives. And you can see we have declined since 1991, but still one out of 10 animals that are four and five is still probably too high and something that the industry needs to work on. One thing that many people ask is, okay, as cattle get fatter, does that change the quality grade? And what we want to show here is a slide that from the National Beef Quality Audit using actually the instrument data that we were able to collect in 2011. And in that instrument, what we're looking at here in this slide is the fat thickness across the bottom. It goes from 0.25 all the way to greater than 1.05 inches. And you'll see it's broken down by a tenth between those two. And you'll notice that the yellow line, the mustard, you'll notice that the mustard colored line is uh, choice. The brownish line is select. Uh, the gray line is choice and the green line is uh, others like no roll or um, older cattle or USDA standards which uh, you'll learn about in the quality grading section uh, of the course. And you'll notice that uh, generality uh, as you get to about six tenths the percent choice cattle pretty well plateau at that point. And so as an industry we actually feed to about six tenths of an inch of fat, 6,500, somewhere in there to try to maximize the percent choice. But when we get over that we also get more yield grade fours and fives. So and, and as you can see from this slide there's really no advantage of getting cattle fatter than that to tr just tr try to get a higher percent choice. That there is a plateau, that their cattle will go to a certain point and then the, as far as an industry, the percent choice will not dramatically increase once you get cattle fatter than that place, which is about six tenths.